Via telephone, Senator Shelley Moore Capito joins us now live. Good morning, Senator Capito. Pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Good morning. You have uh, retired Admiral Bill Stubblefield and uh, not retired owner Mike Hornby. <laughs> not yet. Good morning. <laughs> with us, by hey, the way. Hey, Bill. Hey, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, Senator. And Mr. Hornby, he he says he's ready to succeed you as senator whenever you're ready to retire because he's got a true. he's got one session in at the House of Delegates. He's ready to roll. He's got a doubt. He's a yeah, quick well. learner. <laughs> well, you got to give credit to Moore Capito for that because yeah. he brought me in early and gave me lots of lessons. So. Hey, well, that's good. For more. Yeah. He's a good. Uh, I thought, I remember when he was going in the first time when Moore was going in. He said, "What should I do?" And I said, "I'm going to tell you what my dad told you: sit in the back and listen for the first year." And uh, he says that's what he did. I don't know, Mike. I don't know if that's what he told you. I, I'll give I'll give Moore credit. He is a great listener. I mean, I I sit to two uh, <laughs> two seats to the left of him, and uh, I always give him heck. But uh, he was great to deal with all year. Good. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks. Very nice. Hey, let's talk about this uh, debt ceiling deal that finally came through, uh, Senator Capito. So for a while, we did the usual debt ceiling dance that we always seem to do. We always seem to have to create a lot of drama before this eventually gets settled. What was eventually the key, as you saw it, to getting this enacted? Well, in my book, the first thing we needed to do was to, to uh, you know, not default on the national debt. I mean, I think that would have had global economic implications. It wouldn't have been good for any of us in West Virginia. But it also presented a great opportunity to uh, negotiate, and that's what Kevin McCarthy did. He negotiated lower spending levels uh, to try to bend the curve. Some people say it's not enough or it's, it's not as much as they're saying, but it's in the right direction, in my view. Uh, it also uh, clawed back some of that COVID uh, dollars that we've been trying to get a hold of that the Democrats just didn't want to let hold, let loose of, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars there. Also clawed back some of the IRS money that they're going to be using to hire 87,000 new IRS agents. And, and so, you know, that along with the permitting reform piece, which is very significant, was enough to tell me that the responsible thing is to vote yes to move this along and build on what we've seen uh, through the debt limit deal. And that's what I did. In the House, and I know it's not your job to comment on the House, but Mr. Mm -hmm. McCarthy this morning and yesterday is essentially uh, under uh, going uh, or having to deal with a bit of a revolt among his more conservative members in the House. Is there anything similar to that going on in the Senate over this deal? Well, I think I, at, in the, at the end of the day, only 17 Republican senators voted for this negotiated product. And I think, honestly, I think that's probably because of the revolt that was beginning to occur in the House. And I think, you know, my view of all this is that if, unless you have both houses, the House and the Senate and the presidency, you have to negotiate some kind of deal to move forward. I, I prefer governing. I'd rather go forward and then and then try to uh, to keep uh, bending the curve on spending through appropriations, which I'm on the appropriations committee. So I don't think there's a revolt in the Senate, but there's certainly a certain segment that is is the it's never enough segment. And uh, and so, you know, as long as that uh, doesn't prevent us from going forward and everybody has their voices heard, I think that's that's, uh, you know, that's that's the way it is. But, you know, we don't have control of the United States Senate, and we're far from it right now. And so we have to negotiate something to move it forward. Bill? Yeah, good morning, Senator. Uh, good morning. From this, I, to me, the most satisfying factor was the fact that there could be bipartisan support. Uh, we get uh, hung up so much with one one of the two sides uh, stalling or keeping the uh, process stagnated. This time, both sides work together, and the moderates of both sides, I think, prevail. I found that to be exceptionally satisfying. Well, even in the House, if you look at the vote in the House, it was 314 to 117. So, you know, that is a, uh, an overwhelming uh, uh, majority there of the of the House move forward with what the Speaker was able to negotiate. And, and I'm with you, Bill. I mean, we have to have, you know, the better ideas. A lot of times people say in politics, if, you know, if what if if the far left and the far right are mad at you, then you've done something right because you've you've moved through the massive you know, middle where uh, many of us live. And, and I know, you know, I'm hearing from folks that are saying, you know, it's, it's not enough. And 
but it's but it is something and 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 I think that's significant uh because you, remember president biden didn't want to negotiate he also wanted to have a, what's called a clean debt ceiling no negotiation on spending so that became a moot point when he realized that the house was serious and could actually pass their own plan uh and move forward that way yeah i found that his position to be uh strange because he said traditionally they did not but that was not the case when obama no. was in uh, 2011 uh president obama negotiated correct yeah. and we've negotiated i think of the last seven times that this has been passed the, la- the last four have had some kind of negotiated mm-hmm. settlement and sometimes it's hard to get to that to that point or that bill where you can negotiate something on spending because our appropriations process has been broken now in this bill we're going to be required to move forward with 12 appropriations bills which is music to my ear as an appropriator and so we're going to be able to there grab onto spending and uh, again get rid of programs or get rid of spending that is uh you know more frivolous spending and set our priorities to what we really care about michael Senator, uh, what role, if any, did you have in uh, getting the Mountain Air Valley Pipeline as part of this deal, and what do you think that means for West Virginia as far as? Uh... Well, the Mountain Valley Pipeline is absolutely critical for uh, for our state. I mean, I've had this has been going on for quite some time, so I've had numerous uh, numerous uh, conversations with uh, not just the speaker, with also with my Republican and Democrat colleagues in the in the Senate. We've had um we had amendments on this i had a i have a permitting bill that has uh permitting on of the uh mvp pipeline to be complete so i think it was a uh, uh carol miller obviously senator mansion uh all of us were pulling in the same direction I, I think it's important for people to know that because some of the pushback here has been well there's not enough judicial review this pipeline has been in the fourth circuit eight different times and it's just been pushed and stalled, I think, for political reasons. It's 95% complete. It will be now completed by the end of the year. So uh, I, I, it will be thousands of jobs, uh, a whole lot of uh, tax revenues to the states and localities and, uh, and money for the landowners. So uh, I think the economic impacts are great, but I, it just makes common sense. And I, I think it, it was tough to get it done this way. But I think it was uh, it was a heavy lift for everybody. But uh, I certainly weighed in repeatedly uh, in on this process. Senator, why was Senator uh, Tim Kaine against it? Uh, Tim Kaine was I, I thought the argument and I really liked Tim Kaine, but I thought the argument that he made uh, was was not was not a good argument. He says, first of all, landowners in Virginia are getting going to get nothing out of this. Well, that's not true. The land's already been bought. And paid for in Virginia, the landowners have been paid, and they've already settled on this. He says there was no judicial review. It's gone through the circuit court um, nine times, and also the Virginia. He says we haven't had enough, you know, uh, uh, oversight in permitting. The Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, which is the equivalent to our our DEP in West Virginia, their permit had already been issued. The Biden administration has already issued a fish and wildlife permit, a forestry, uh, division of forestry permit. So this has been scrutinized all down the line. So I didn't think Tim's argument was quite ringing true. Uh, I think he just didn't like the process more than anything. And uh, and so I think that's why he was fighting it. You mentioned uh, two words there, completion and Virginia. Which leads me to a question about uh, <laughs> Corridor H. All right, so let's let's talk about that because I know you attended a groundbreaking there recently. Well, I yes, they're going to uh, begin the the rest of the uh, completion of that or that portion uh, from Parsons up to Davis, which is really difficult uh, portion of Corridor H, and uh, and then hopefully we'll get the Wardensville uh, to the Virginia line complete. I think it's already under contract. This has been a long, long since 19, the 1960s. Uh, we've put a lot more money into it, but it's, it's the difficult terrain right now that's uh, having trouble uh, uh, because it's very expensive. And also it's been fought, again, through court, court, court. 
and it's time for the quarter H to be completed. It's a magnificent highway, and uh, it, it's going to really open up that area for tourism, for uh, economic development, for more residents. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Your reaction to the seven-count indictment yesterday handed down against former President Trump? Well, I mean, I, I think I'm a bit shocked uh, because I, I think that obviously this is a big step for the Department of Justice. And I, I think as I read through comments from my uh, uh, fellow senators and others, uh, uh, you know, the concern of a targeted indictment against a, a potential uh, political rival of the president who's overseeing the Department of Justice. Um, I don't know what the counts are. Uh, I, I think that it, uh, you know, we have to wait and see on that. But, uh, you know, I, I'm very concerned about the politicization of the DOJ and the targeting of an individual for his political backgrounds. But let's see, and, and, and you know, being President Trump, let's see what happens on Tuesday. But honestly, I was, I didn't think this would come to anything. I thought it would be investigation that then just led to, you know, a, a slap on the wrist kind of thing. Be more careful about your documents and, and, and move on, because this is a big step. Is the I know you're not the judge here, but is the obstruction part of this what is uh, really bringing about the indictments? Because we all heard the reports of President Biden having classified documents next to exactly. his Corvette uh, in his. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the list of people. I mean, if you went searching through your stuff, you probably would find one there, too, I'm guessing. Well, Hope I not. think that uh, President <laughs> uh, President Biden, uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, former Vice President Mike Pence. I mean, I think that, you know, we see that, you know, how do you how do you evaluate to degrees uh, keeping a, sec a separate document? And uh, it doesn't seem, you know, as though it's been treated fairly or on, on an even keel at all. And I, I don't know about the obstruction uh, part of it. Uh, I, I did read at one point where it said that uh, Mark Meadows, who was former chief of staff, had, uh, had well, here's the term, copped a plea. That means, you know, he slipped. I don't know what that means. So I think there's a lot of information gap here. The, for the life of me, I don't know why we're hearing on a Thursday night he's indicted when he actually doesn't get indicted for four more days. That gap there is suspicious in its own right. Uh, so... I think there's a lot of questions to be asked here. Final question, Bill. Uh, no, I'll, there's a lot of questions I'd like to ask, but I'm not sure we have time. Uh, uh, but I, I, I guess I do have one question. Uh, I thought the grand juror, he's going to be indicted in Florida, uh, yet the grand juror in Florida uh, convened only a few days before. Uh, how, how could they put out an indictment after being in session only for a very short period of time. I know why they want to go to Florida as opposed to D.C., but I don't see how the mechanics allow them to give an indictment in that short a period of time. Here again, these are so many fundamental questions, and what it, what it looks like is that President Trump has been treated differently than everybody else, and, and that should not be the case. He should be treated uh, you know, equally under the law and, uh, you know, moving around, as you're saying, Bill, just raises suspicions without explanation. So I, I think that um, this just feeds the what I'm sure President Trump's going to feed big time in the next four days is I'm being targeted for the wrong reasons. I'm a political rival. I'm going to uh, be the nominee for the Republican presidential nominee. And they, and they know I can win. And this is the only way to take me down is through the justice system. And we can't have that kind of uh, opening for uh, what we have now, an erosion in our confidence in our uh, our institutions. I mean, Bill, you start you talked about our veterans, and look at all the suspicious uh, suspicion around our military that we have now, and around our you know FBI and other. We could we could go down a whole list, and and this just uh, feeds into that. Uh, erosion of trust of our, our fundamental uh, uh, government institutions that we've built our country on. Senator Capito, thank you so much for your time this morning. As always, greatly appreciated. All right. You guys have a good weekend, and thank you. Thank you.